My words carry weight as an out-of-town expert, but to my friends and family, I am hardly believed. Some folks say it was Luke who first wrote this, but really it was written much earlier by Pliny the Elder. Nemo profeta in sua patria, no one is an expert in their own home. This talk eventually will lead me onto a concept called a tesseract, a Euclidean geometrical reality that can be applied to anything and to faces and bites and airways. My name is Paul Kociancic. As a surgeon, I invented a surgical process called IMDO, a way of correcting the associated effects caused by small jaws and essentially by a motto of expand, distract, and align. But to explain IMDO, I have to explain something else first. I have to explain how camouflage orthodontics works for treating teeth and bad bites. Edward Engel, Pierre Robin, David Poswillow. These men formed the original ideas surrounding bad bites. In 1898... Edward Angle gave an idea that crowded teeth was caused by too many teeth, that premolars and wisdom teeth were redundant and did not belong in a modern world with a modern diet. His ideas of bad bites led to a global acceptance for dental extractions combined with braces and orthodontics. The invention of patterns of dental extractions combined with braces, has been a mainstay of orthodontic practice for 130 years. This idea of extracting teeth, both baby and adult, has been part and parcel of how orthodontics has always managed dental crowding and bad bites. The idea of serial extractions in 8 to 11 year old children of first their baby teeth and then a set of brand new permanent premolars is based upon absolutely believing in the idea of too many back teeth that dental extractions are okay and that straight front teeth is the entire cosmetic objective. Braces inevitably follow at around 13 or 14 years of age. First, baby canines are removed, helping relieve a little bit of the adult incisal crowding. What follows is a sequence of baby molar extractions, followed by eruption and extraction of permanent premolars, and then the eruption of the permanent canines. After braces, at around 16 to 18 years, the redundant wisdom teeth will be removed too. Prominent and crooked front teeth is a common presentation to orthodontists. Dental extractions of permanent premolars work here too, allowing for room to pull back or distalize the prominent front teeth using braces but there is an eternal debate as to whether these simple orthodontic measures may also change the facial profile and the way lips should meet. Reducing the distance of a dental overjet or how far upper front teeth sit forward of their lower counterparts is the overwhelming majority of work in orthodontic practice today. And over the years, new orthodontic treatments have developed to help prevent dental extractions of premolars. Elastics easily pull backwards spaced front teeth in cartoons. But to create that space, orthodontists have developed a range of expanders, this time using springs. And the effect is always the same. The orthodontic effort is always to push backwards the prominent and crowded front teeth. Most children with crowded and prominent front teeth 
benefit from a short period of deliberate upper jaw expansion. The dental hyrax not only widens the dental arch, increasing dental arch circumference, but it has a surprising effect on widening the nasal airway too. But the orthodontic effect is always the same. It's always to pull backwards the upper front teeth. In 1923, Pierre Robin wrote to the world about the small lower jaw. He saw this everywhere on the streets and in the hospitals of Paris, a condition he called mandibular hypoplasia, and he saw that it led to cot death in babies and serious medical and dental problems in adults. The feeding and breathing problems he saw in babies was caused by a small jaw, and which also eventually led to a range of orthodontic problems but he also saw that there was a collapsing tongue, a condition he called glossoptosis, which led to chronic airway obstruction and secondary problems such as poor sleep and exercise intolerance and poor physical development. We celebrate Pierre Robin in understanding small jaws in babies, but Pierre Robin had had a professional lifetime of seeing small jaws in adults and adolescents. Twenty years earlier, in 1903, he had already developed small jaw reposition splints, and these splints helped hold forward the small lower jaw, as well as the tongue, to help adults breathe, and it's a thing we call dental sleep splints today. Orthodontists soon saw that using the jaw reposition splints there was an even better way of trying to pull backwards prominent upper front teeth. By holding the small lower jaw forward, it created an elastic pressure to also push backwards prominent upper front teeth. The upper splint widened the upper dental arch, and the lower splint pulled forward the small lower jaw. This in turn provided an elastic pullback on the prominent upper front teeth. Overall, this simply worked better than elastics or braces in both avoiding premolar extractions and in pulling back the dental overjet. But there were problems. Chronically pulling the lower jaw forward over a number of childhood years is very uncomfortable for most children, and compliance with constant wearing of removable splints during sleep and at night is a major issue. Orthodontists then developed a fixed appliance which could not be removed by the child or adolescent. Strong bars fixed between the upper and lower back teeth forced the lower jaw to slide forward, and this very effectively created an elastic pushback on the entire upper arch of teeth. And at whatever age the appliance was used, it was extremely effective at pushing backwards prominent upper front teeth and suppressing upper jaw growth and enabling a degree of normal or natural lower jaw growth to occur in what was always a relatively smaller lower jaw. As these appliances were only applied to growing children with small lower jaws, it became a debate as to whether these dental appliances affixed only to molar teeth, actually caused or stimulated more lower jaw growth than what was already naturally happening. Do growth splints simply make upper jaws smaller? And can this be applied to non-growing adults with prominent front teeth? Subsequently, an idea developed that you could simply acquire a new bite and reduce the prominence of the upper front teeth by training a person to consciously hold their lower jaw forward. People certainly wanted to believe that treating prominent front teeth by a combination of orthodontically shrinking the upper jaw 
and by training a person to hold their small lower jaw forward made you look better. But away from the camera and in the real world, the small lower jaw will always go back to where it started. In orthodontics and in Australia where I live, we call this effect the Sunday smile, the best smile that you can achieve for your Sunday best and for the orthodontist's camera to prove that holding your small lower jaw forward is something that an orthodontist can train you to do. And the Sunday smile and the small jaw has always been known since Pierre Robin first talked about it in 1903 using jaw splints. In 2013, to settle the debate, did orthodontics simply shrink upper jaws and train patients to hold their small jaws forward for the camera? The Cochrane collaboration led by world-leading orthodontic researchers all agreed all orthodontic treatments were the same. Nothing belonging to orthodontics made a small lower jaw normal. So now we knew. Class 2 Division 1 malocclusion and prominent upper front teeth were the same effective condition. And orthodontics treated prominent front teeth the same way as dental orthopaedics did. And using jaw splints worked in the same way as orthodontic elastics and classical orthodontics and braces. Nothing in orthodontics or orthopaedics could make a small lower jaw bigger. All that braces or splints could do was pull prominent front teeth backwards. Everyone agreed. In treating prominent upper front teeth, orthodontics and orthopaedics worked the same way, which we called the headgear effect. Headgear has been used for decades, and they hold back the natural growth of the upper jaw, whilst the small lower jaw and forehead continue to naturally grow forward. Knowing that all orthodontics restricts midfacial growth in growing children, and recognising we train non-growing patients to hold their jaws forward for the camera, means we all should see that treatments with orthodontics and orthopaedics still leaves all our patients with a small jaw. But Pierre Robin did not invent his jaw splints to help pull backwards upper front teeth. He was using jaw splints to help his adult patients overcome snoring for what we call obstructive sleep apnea today. Robin called it glossoptosis, and rarely he saw the effects of small jaws also in newborn babies, where it caused sudden infant death, and more rarely he saw an association of neonatal small jaws with an even rarer palatal cleft. But Robin did see that small jaws were incredibly common, and about 60% of adult Parisians had one, and the frequency of small jaws in his mind was the entire cause of dental crowding and prominent front teeth, and of all forms of malocclusion and bad bites, of poor neck and body postures from the effects of obstructed airways, and which was also the cause of obstructive sleep apnea, and overall poor physical development and long-term health. But all we remember of Robin today is the extremely rare association of a rare palatal cleft with the neonatal small jaw. It was David Pozuelo in celebrating Pierre Robin's life when in 1968 his paper explained how these clefts formed. And forever after, the name of Pierre Robin was associated not exclusively to an adult small jaw, but instead to a rare neonatal condition. Pierre Robin syndrome, a condition that described the lifetime effects that Robin saw as occurring from a small jaw, from birth through to old age, became instead P. 
Pierre Robin sequence. It was an accident of science and a misunderstanding of great men. The rear cleft was a combination of the common small jaw and the rare event of low amniotic fluid, which in combination caused a catch and a critical developmental milestone in palatal formation was missed and a cleft occurred. And that's how Pozzuolo famously described it. Eventually, Pierre Robin syndrome, instead of describing all small jaws and in all ages of people, came to describe only the small jaw in babies. And with it, the associated and intrinsic glossoptosis and risk of cot death, as well as a rare palatal cleft. Today, we treat life-threatening neonatal small jaws with jaw distraction and surgery, and we recognise the airway implications of the small jaw caused by glossoptosis. But for adolescents and adults who remain with small jaws, we recognise only their dental problems, and we see only prominent or crooked front teeth and a bad bite and a wicked chin. It was only Pierre Robin that originally saw the commonality of the small jaw, as well as all the effects that a poor airway would bring to later life, but the memory of his original thoughts have been largely rewritten. The universality and commonality of the small jaw is entirely unrecognised, and we reduce our treatments to dentistry, within a competition of ideas wholly between dental extractions and braces on one side and jaw splints and again braces on the other. These comparisons of dental treatments, either in cartoons or in real life, absolutely ignore the effects of tongues, of functional upper airways, and of real and accurate facial changes that occur with natural growth into adulthood and old age. Science already tells us that the headgear effect of orthodontics exists, that we might get a better bite, but our hidden price is that we are actively restricting normal midfacial development. Orthodontically, we are reinventing the same treatment over and over, and in the end, we take photos and make fake claims of orthodontic treatment success, ignoring reality. Everything I have talked about is called camouflage orthodontics, and bizarrely, orthodontists call it that too. It's like putting a band-aid on a bullet hole because all of it attempts to hide the real cause behind why dental crowding exists and why bad bites occur and why we have impacted wisdom teeth. It's not 1898 or 1903 or 1923 or 1968 anymore. Surgeons and modern hospitals have a lot more technology and people than our colleagues working in private clinics in orthodontics and dentistry. I really hope that you continue to listen and learn and find out why small tongues and small mandibles go hand in hand and later see how tesseracts work in modern maxillofacial surgery to treat and prevent a modern Western disease called obstructive sleep apnea.